Bankless Nation, it's time for the ETH Futures Derby. It just began last week, and the past week has been unprecedented, to say the least. That's a word we use in today's episode. Several, not just one, but several Ethereum Futures ETF launched for the first time in the US, the first time ever. So what does this mean for crypto? Volumes have been surprisingly low. Is that a surprise? Is that bearish? Will volumes pick up? And regardless, if they don't, what do all of these ETH ETFs mean for crypto? Are Bitcoin spot ETFs next? And after that, maybe do we get Ether spot ETFs? David, who do we have on the show today to explain all of this and walk us through these questions? Mr. ETF himself, Eric Balakunas. Uh, he is a commentator on Bloomberg, on Twitter, and just knows perhaps everything there is to know about these ETF products, the ins and the outs. Eric's going to tell you all the reasons why these particular Ether Future ETF products are dumb and bad and are just simply a means to an end of a much better, <laughs> brighter future, which we definitely talk about, that Eric thinks is coming very soon this calendar year, which of course is the spot Bitcoin ETFs, and a much sooner than expected a spot ether etf then i think ryan and i were ready for in this oh, yeah. show this so a bullish episode there's guys. been a bunch of conversations around crypto twitter's like why are people so excited about this futures product uh this show will answer that question it's a means to an end and that end is much closer than what people think meanwhile while you are getting educated about the spot bitcoin and ether futures etf and all that shenanigans there's another way to get educated which is the a16z startup school uh, just drop out of wherever school you're, if you're in college, you're getting MBA, just drop out, uh, and apply to the A16Z startup school. You'll get some real experience. Uh, what is the A16Z startup school? It is a place for crypto founders to become founders. It is an accelerator program to get your idea, your crypto idea bootstrapped. It's a 12 week in-person school in London, March 27th through June 11th in London, in Britain. Uh, and so this is going to get you your first leg up into the world of crypto. Once you are through the A16Z startup school, if you are accepted, you'll just be slingshotted into the world of uh, seed state ventures, and you can start becoming a founder and building the first product in crypto. Put it on your builder hat at the A16Z startup school. There is a link in the show notes. Uh, deadline to apply, October 20th. That is soon. You do not have too much time after hearing this message, so click the link in the show notes. I should specify, you guys don't actually have to drop out of school. That's, a, you know, not necessary, but Be pretty this, cool. is, this is probably a more useful school than the, the school you're, you're, you're going to now if, if you are in school. David, why is this episode so significant? Why are we spending the time on Bankless, which is a program about crypto? Mm -hmm. I thought we were escaping the banks here, David. Right. Why are we spending time talking about an Ether Futures ETF and the broader implications of that? Eric really said it well. These products are a bridge, a bridge from the crypto protocols to the world of TradFi. Why do we want that? Well, in my mind, this is a winning of a thumb war for the crypto side of things. Uh, they, TradFi gets to have their ETFs, which is their composable unit money Lego for their world. But really, all the value inevitably flows into our world, into Ether, into Bitcoin, uh, through the ETF. Uh, this, is a, this is a win for crypto. It is a stepping stone towards legitimacy. Uh, it is the biggest pipes between tr multiple trillions of dollars of capital and the cryptocurrency market cap, which is just one trillion, and it's really just Bitcoin and Ether, which combined is something like seven to 800 billion. So like think of a pipe. It's the biggest pipe that's ever been constructed. On one end of the pipe is 30 plus trillion dollars of capital management that's what he by, said. by TradFi, that's what he said. And then the 800 billion meager market caps that are the combined Ether and Bitcoin market caps. When a pipe that's very large opens up, in ways that trad fi is only going to be ever comfortable with buying crypto which is in their etf formats that is bullish uh and like i said it's not necessarily going to be these products but these products are the ne necessary prerequisite towards the bigger ones eric explains that this all in this show that we're about to have right now so let's go ahead and get right into that conversation with eric balakunas mr etfs but first a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible especially kraken our preferred crypto exchange for 2023 if you want to actually buy some real bitcoin some real ether and not be confined by the world of tradfi kraken is the place to do it click the link in the show notes to get signed up with kraken today 
Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning-fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. Arbitrum is accelerating the Web3 landscape with a suite of secure Ethereum scaling solutions. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1 with flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. Arbitrum Nova is quickly becoming a Web3 gaming hub and social dApps like Reddit are also calling Arbitrum home. And now Arbitrum Orbit allows you to use Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own layer three, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, enterprise, or user, Arbitrum Orbit it lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. Faster transaction speeds and significantly lower gas fees. So visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first app with Arbitrum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Hiring people worldwide, paying them in crypto, providing them access to benefits, it all is so complex. But it doesn't have to be. Complying with labor laws, payroll rules, tax obligations, and crypto regulations in every country that you employ someone is difficult, time-consuming, manual, and costly. And it's drawing more and more attention from regulators and governments. But there is good news. Toku is here. Toku is the first employment and compensation platform for the crypto industry that makes this easy. Toku helps you hire employees or contractors and pay Pay them in fiat or crypto legally, compliantly, and with all the taxes handled in over a hundred different jurisdictions. So whether you're an early stage company with just a team of two, or you're an enterprise with 200, Toku has a solution that meets your needs. Toku is already working with the leading companies in the space, Protocol Labs, Hedera, Gitcoin, and many more. So transform your employment and token payroll operations with Toku. You can reach out to Toku at toku.com slash bankless, or click the link in the show notes. Bankless Nation, we are very excited to introduce you to Eric Balachunas. He's an analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. He's focused on ETFs, that is exchange traded funds. And Eric knows ETFs. This last week, actually last week, by the time you listen to this, nine ETH future ETFs all launched on last Monday. And Eric is going to help us unpack it this week. Eric, welcome to Bankless. How are you doing? Hey, good. Uh, nice to be here. It's great to have you. You've been covering uh, ETFs, specifically crypto ETFs, with a lot of rigor. You are one of the main accounts I go to when I want up-to-date information. And you had this fantastic hype tweet uh, last Monday, an unprecedented day today with multiple ETFs all launching at the same time. No clear winner has emerged. All of them were pretty average, lower than I would have predicted, but it's a long run. And remember, these hold futures. ETF investors much prefer physical to derivatives. Okay, so... The ETH futures launched uh, last Monday. Tell us, use the words unprecedented. Why is that unprecedented? Right. So there's been many ETF. There's 3,200 ETFs and change, something like that. And um, there's been many launches. There was a gold launch. There's been oil futures ETFs. So it's not so much that it's a ETH or, or futures that's unprecedented. What's unprecedented is the SEC approving many at the same time. Normally in the ETF world, when you file determines when you get out. There's like a protocol to that. And the SEC, for the first time ever, broke from that. And we have heard back channel that the reason they did this is because, um, remember the ProShares Bitcoin Futures ETF launched two years ago. It had like a three-day head start on the rest, and it has like 97% of all the volume of its peers and 94% of the assets. So I think the SEC wanted to eliminate that, what we call first mover advantage, because they didn't want to sort of like give one ETF uh, that that sort of, I don't know, it's almost like playing kingmaker. Although in the ETH futures category, there's not a ton of assets, so it's not like you're going to become a king. But obviously, having them all out at the same time is interesting to us and because it is unprecedented and a foreshadow for the main event, which would be the spot Bitcoin race, where we do think they'll also let many issuers out at once. When you have many issuers out at once, it puts a lot of pressure on marketing and 
uh, maybe C and other variables uh, when you're not first out. So that's why we've seen a little jockeying from like Van Eck, who has a lower fee. Also, they've said they're going to donate 10% of the profits to charity. They've had some commercials, um, Bitwise kind of coming out and saying, you know, we're more crypto native. That's our thing. And then ProShares, you know, probably saying I haven't seen them do too much marketing yet. But obviously, my guess is they're trying to tap their current Bitto clients because they've already got that as a major hit product. So all of them are trying to play to their advantages. And it's just interesting to see who will win. Because generally in an ETF category, there's really only one stud liquid, uh, you know, ETF that uh, has the majority of the volume. And when you have the majority of the volume, it's a good place to be because uh, you you have pricing power. Uh, when other ones come out that are lower fee, um, it's harder for them to penetrate your liquidity. And uh, for the people who like to trade, they value liquidity. So that's why to this day, GLD is still the most traded gold ETF, even though there's dozens and many more cheaper. And something like EEM, which is the iShares Emerging Markets, there's been many cheaper, four times cheaper, and EEM still trades a couple billion a day because there's definitely a crowd who just loves liquidity and prefers it. So those are the dynamics in this race that as an analyst, it's interesting uh, to look at. Um, although I gotta say, there's really not been enough volume overall to really make anyone a winner yet. Um, it's going to take a while. Normally, you know, in a couple of days, I think this one, it will take a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I think Bankless listeners are certainly familiar with the idea that uh, liquidity is this black hole. The network effects uh, lead to a single dominant winner. Eric, I want to ask about this signal that nine different products are all launching at once. You call this unprecedented. What, what should we know about this, the, the significance of so many suppliers coming into the market all at once to serve this product? Yeah, so it's actually not nine. It was nine ready to launch. Mm. Uh, one of them withdrew, just like any horse race where, you know, <laughs> you know, like in the Kentucky Derby, there's a few scratches. Uh, volatility shares dropped out. Um, Kelly, I think, was late to launch. Um, I'm missing one. Um, and then Valkyrie was more of a name change. But anyway, um, just to make a long story short, there's seven or eight on the market. And remember, um, a couple of them have Bitcoin and Ether together. So I wouldn't call those exact replicas, but there's definitely, without a doubt, three straight Ether ETFs um, and then three or four Bitcoin plus Ether, all of those launching at the same time. Um, and so I think if you're in this community, um, and I, I try to tell people this, um, you know, Ether and futures, in my opinion, are, are not, like you have spot Bitcoin. That's always been the holy grail. So this is neither of those. This is not Bitcoin, it's Ether, which to me, from my point of view, you guys may differ from the, in the crypto world and Matt Hogan thinks Ether is gonna be bigger than, than Bitcoin. But to me, it's like the no name opening band before the headliner, you know, you go to see a band and <laughs> like, you're like, uh, you know. I'm sure it's just, like that for a lot of institutions too, to be fair right, right now, right? Right. Yeah, this is the band you just talk to your friend through and just, you know, you just, okay, <laughs> let's get through it and let, let okay. And then when your band, the regular band comes on, that you came to see, you go crazy. Um, and I think that's what this feels like. It's just like a eh, opening event. And other, the other thing is, not only is Bitcoin, I think way more um, I interesting to casual people, but the, the idea that it's spot, there's something about derivatives that's like spring advisor repellent on the ETF. They don't like ETFs that hold futures contracts um, it came, it really comes from a history of ETFs when there was like natural gas and oil futures ETFs. There's certain commodities where you can't do spot because like if you did an oil, you can't, an oil spot ETF would require the ETF issuer storing barrels of oil in a warehouse and the oil goes bad. It's dangerous. It stinks. Um, you can't do it just like you can't do spot corn. Uh, you could do spot gold. Just you have to think to yourself, could I actually store this in a warehouse? How hard mm -hmm. is that? And if it, you know, gold, silver, palladium, platinum, you can do that, but not with uh, oil, natural gas. In the case of oil, going from one month futures contract and then selling it and buying the next month out before that one expires, that's called rolling. That can cost you 20, 30% in the oil market. So USO and UNG have burned advisors. So they have this once bitten, twice bitten, three times shy kind of thing with using futures ETFs. So that's why I don't put, I don't, I, I was, you know, I had already sort of lowered my expectations because they're futures. That said, I just think you should, 
the crypto world should look at all of these as bridges to the advisory world and traditional finance. And it's going to facilitate some traffic because Bitwise has salespeople. ProShares has salespeople. Um, who's the other one? Vanek has salespeople. When they go out and talk to somebody, a client, an advisor, they're going to have in their toolbox uh, an Ether Futures ETF now. So if the advisor has a client who's just really into this particular cryptocurrency, bam, hey, well, we have that. So over time, just the fact that this is one of the ETFs in the menu of things they're selling to advisors is probably overall good. Like I said, it's like a bridge to this whole other world. Um, it's just that the natural interest right now for it is pretty weak. Um, but it's a long game. It's a long run. This is a bridge that just opened, um, I think, compared to Bitto. When Bitto launched, it was at the October 2021, which was the height of a mania. It was like Bitcoin mm. fever, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it launched, bam, right into that. And it, it tapped into this immediate unmet demand. But what's interesting is it took in a billion in the first week. It still has a billion. So it's almost the reciprocal where everything came in in like three days to Bitto. Clearly, there had been some pent up demand. It it got that. But then after that, there was it was just more traded. It wasn't like there was a ton of demand. Part of it is because the crypto uh, Bitcoin fell a lot. That was, Bitto was kind of the top. And then Bitcoin fell. The mania kind of died down. Then you had FTX. So Bitto has been at the same asset level as the first three days it launched. I think this is the reverse. And I think the spot Bitcoin will be the reverse where it won't have this really quick day one, day two um, a bonanza where it breaks records and whatnot. But over time, as the, the sort of slow um, penetration of these products gets into the advisor community, uh, you know, they're going to nibble here and there. And I think over, over the long haul, you're looking at a, a very vibrant category. But I, I will say one thing. Let's just say there's an Ether spot and a Bitcoin spot. These futures ETFs will go extinct. Really? Only, yeah, I was going to ask is, you about this. So these are basically inferior. You, you were talking about an opening band versus kind of you know the main the the main act, right? Yeah. And it, but the futures are basically kind of the opener for the main act, which is spot, right? Because futures are an inferior product. Uh, is that correct? And that's due to primarily slippage fees from a kind of investor perspective. Yeah, it's from that a process of rolling from one month to the next. So this year, mm. like for example, Bitto is probably trailing Bitcoin uh, returns by seven, eight percent. Mm -hmm. Now you're up 65 percent, so you're not that pissed off. But still, if I told you Bitto charged six percent fee, you'd be like, that's outrageous. So that is outrageous. Roll, <laughs> yeah, roll costs don't show up in the expense ratio, but they are real. And again, advisors have had a history of learning this the hard way through these other commodities. So um, when the spot comes out, you're going to find a migration over to spot. So these futures are almost like placeholders. Um, but again, it's getting the, it, it, as long as these issuers are out having conversations with people, um, that's probably good. But over time, the spot will render the futures probably almost useless. For example, there was a gold futures ETF, DGL. Um, it just closed up shop about a year ago. Um, it had, I think at its peak, 500 million, and then just went down and down. And the issuer is like, what's the point? Um, so gold spot ETFs have 100% of the assets in the gold category. So, uh, you know, I'm a fan of patterns. I would assume something similar would happen with both Ether and Bitcoin, where the spot would just take over and the futures would slowly go extinct. Well, I want to ask you about another product. So we talked about futures, we talked about spot. There's already these trust type products, which are, I don't know what you'd classify them as, but you know, something like a GBDC on the Bitcoin side and on Ether, the only way I could previously purchase um, Ether inside of my Fidelity account or something like this, or Charles Schwab was to buy ETH E is the product. And this is a trust. How, do, how do Ether futures compare to ETH E? Yeah. So I would say compared to GBTC and ETH E, the futures are a step up. Okay. Because here's why. Day to day, the Ether futures and the ETH, uh, Bitcoin futures ETF are going to track spot pretty damn well. Day to day. Over a year, you may have roll costs creep in. But if you're trading it, there really is, it's not that bad. Um, the bigger issue, but, but still, if you bought Ether futures or Bitcoin futures, let's say you made a call and you said, you know what, I think uh, Ether is going to go up 20% and you bought Ether Futures ETFs, um, and let's say it went up 20% over a year, 
you might get 18%, right? Or 17%. So you, you made a bet and you got most of the money, right? You're not like, you're not, you're, you're a little pissed, but it's, you know, it's, you can live with that. The problem with ETH -E and GBTC is you can actually make that bet and lose money. That's insane mm. to me. That is going to leave a real nasty taste in investors' mouth. It's a mouth. stupid product, right? It's like, it, 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 just, yes, it, it doesn't it's make broken. sense. It's broken. It, it's essentially the, the reason ETFs rule and have really swept the country is not just that they're low costs and they're liquid. It's, it's that they're arbitrageable. So because you have creations mm. of shares and redemptions of shares every day, all day, there's like a two-way street. If the price of the ETF creeps up above or below the underlying, someone can arb that and make risk-free profit. So that natural incentive to arbitrage is amazing. That's the secret sauce of ETFs. And you don't have that in ETH and GBTC. These are simply a fixed amount of shares that was issued in a private trust that they allowed to trade over the counter. So you cannot go and create new shares or destroy them in the same way you can with an ETF. And this is part of why ETFs have have sort of kicked to the side other fund vehicles, one of them being closed-end funds, which have the same problem, which is the price uh, is unhinged from the value of the underlying. And I always tell people, like, you know, when the SEC didn't approve it, I was like, this is dumb. They should approve it immediately because even if Bitcoin goes down or up or sideways, uh, people are okay with that. They just want to, when they make a bet, they want the bet to be with their bet, not some other variable. And so in the case of GBTC, I could point out a time where you had the bet right, but you lost money because of that discount that formed in GBTC, or you lost, or Bitcoin was down and you were down double. And that is really nasty, nasty mm -hmm. surprise. And so that's why I am a proponent and de dedicated my career to ETFs is because I, I th they have a great track record and they're just a, a good technology that just allows people to get a fair deal. Doesn't mean it's going to go up, obviously, it can go down, but at least you go down the same. Um, and there's no, like, there's nothing else there. Now, the futures ETFs, I could say, you do have that third element of roll costs, which is why we do consider those red light ETFs. To me, ETFs need uh, movie ratings, and there are some <laughs> R rated ETFs, and I do put anything that rolls futures is rated R, which mm. is so ironic because a spot Bitcoin ETF would be a green light rated PG ETF to me. Um, isn't that ironic? The SEC approved all these R-rated ETFs in our system, at least, and they even approved the double leveraged Bitcoin futures, which is like, like that's almost like NC17, right? <laughs> and yet they won't approve the spot. So the whole thing is so silly, um, in my opinion. Um, and so this is why uh, the ETF is so coveted and desired. Um, and I yeah, think, you know, even for a crypto person and you can use your own wallet and stuff and that's great you should use it but for a good you know giant massive investors especially uh, boomers and but even young people but anybody who uses an advisor in particular ETFs are the preferred vehicle because this amazing track record of tracking the underlying well having very good tax efficiency and being you know low cost and I'll get that instant liquidity whenever you want it on exchanges so um, that's why this is such a big deal to us is because you're sort of your marriage of two worlds, which is the sort of traditional finance boomer advisors and the crypto world. The ETF is sort of like the bridge that will unite them. Um, and it's a good bridge. It's a sturdy bridge. And that's why I would, I'm a proponent of it since it's really the Winklevoss filing. Oh, I mean, we, we, we like it and we're fans of it. And I, you know, I think it's great. And I, what's more, I, I will emphasize, I think it's a kind of a, a retail crime that it wasn't approved earlier. When you've got pro products like GBTC and ETH -E that are trading either, you know, two, three X of NAV or like below that. And right now, ETH -E is like 25% below that. And I don't even know what we're, we're betting on. That that has to be beyond an NC-17 rating. I don't even know what mm. that is. It's just uh, <laughs> it's it's silly. Bad it's movie. silly that we have those products. But l let me ask one, one last question on this whole idea of this being unprecedented. Okay, so it was unprecedented because um, so many were launched at kind of the same time. The, the other 
and I don't want to lose sight of this. I think this is important. Or you, or you tell us, Eric. The other reason I think this is unprecedented is because, look, crypto has a lot of different assets. You know, go look at our long tail of assets beyond Bitcoin and Ether. All right, we we could name a whole bunch uh, for you. Some of which you may have heard of. Some of which you know no one's heard of. Um, but this is the first time that an ETH futures ETF was approved in the United States, and I'm wondering what that says about Ether as an asset relative to the long tail of other crypto assets, if anything. Is that unprecedented? Is that significant to have an Ether's futures? Are we saying effectively that the SEC is saying, oh, it's not really a security, but yeah. like we can't I, say I, it's not a security? I get this a lot. I, I can't say I'm. Uh, this is my wheelhouse. Um, and I get that you would read into that, but let me give you some background that's a little not yet known or isn't that known, which is that the reason Ether e Futures ETFs came out, I don't think is more the SEC changing its uh, opinion of it being a security or not, but more of the fact that E Futures are traded on the CME, which just means they're regulated by the CTFC, CFTC, whatever, right? Which is which is the C is commodities in CFTC. Yes, true. So, but that's a whole nother issue. I will let the regulating analysts debate mm -hmm. that. But I don't think this was approved because of a change in whether ETH is a security. I think this was approved simply because a that is the ETH futures are regulated in a way, and b there's a company named Ball Shares who ran the stop sign. The SEC had said, don't file these, and there was a filing. They told them withdrawal. This happened like four or five times over the last eight years. And then Fall Shares came in with this Bitcoin leverage futures ETF. SEC said, please don't do this. But Fall Shares is like, I'm just a small company. I don't really care. Uh, you're going to have to send me a cease and desist or I'm launching. And they, they called their, they basically like, basically called the SEC's bluff. And the SEC did not do that, and they launched. And so VolShares is like, all right, well, that worked. Let's do ETH futures. And so in a way, VolShares, that's why we call him uh, the Dark Knight. He's sort of like vigilante justice, this guy hmm. named Stu. Um, he really forced the issue on the SEC. And I think because of the Grayscale suit and some other things, I don't think the SEC had the um, strength or even care. I think they just backed down. And so in a way, hmm. I don't think they love that these are launching. <laughs> but this one issuer kind of pushed the issue. And so I don't, I don't think, think it's them changing their mind on yeah. – but I will say the fact that they, did, they didn't fight this issue or tooth and nail shows that maybe there is some softening overall in their whole thing. And again, we have heard back channel uh, – you know, you heard it here first. Now others are reporting it that the SEC is engaging with the issuers on their spot filing. So even though they were all delayed till January, they're sending emails to the spot filer saying – Hey, could you please uh, address the comments we have about your S1 filing? That is a really good sign. They never did that. Is this for Bitcoin prostate. only spot filing, Eric, spot or Bitcoin, Bitcoin and Ether? I have not heard anything on the Ether front. Okay. My guess is whatever they fix for the bot, the spot Bitcoin will carry over. But my hmm. guess also is the SEC is probably going to be like, let's get Bitcoin done first, and then we'll look to Ether after. Do a, mm -hmm. you know, just do us a favor. Let's put this off to the next run. So my guess is you'd probably have a batch of Bitcoin and then and then Ether. But the good news is if you can get it all the SEC's comments um, answered in this S1 for Bitcoin, uh, it's an, it all of that would apply to the Ether situation as mm -hmm. far as I know. So um, I would just sort of leave it there in terms of that. So I just I don't think there was a change in their view. Right. It yeah. was more of those other reasons. Yeah. So let, let's zoom out then and, and try and place the significance of this week in just the arc that is the story of crypto being accepted and legitimized in the traditional finance world. So like, why do we care about an Ether futures ETF when we know, like what you said is like, these are all just going to be considered defunct once we get a spot Ethers ETF in the future. So is this just meant to be like a stepping stone to get to that point? Does this account for why some of the volume was maybe on the lower side? Like what, what is the real significance of this week if we're not truly excited about the actual products being released here? Yeah, stepping stone is a good word for it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it, it's all progress. And the more this becomes just a familiar thing to the SEC regulators and advisors, 
Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to be good for the overall acceptance of this by that, again, more conservative, conservative boomer crowd. Um, I, I guess that's how I'd look at it. Um, but to your point, uh, you know, to my point at the beginning, this is, again, the equivalent of it's not like this isn't like Lollapalooza where I'm going to be Gen X here, where you have like, you know, Smashing Pumpkins opening for Primus and like both bands are good. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is like the band you never heard of. Nobody's ever heard of. And they will go nowhere opening for Smashing Pumpkins or Rage Against the Machine or something like this. Alice in Chains. Um, how, how much of that is you true ask me because to do, of like, the millennial Lollapalooza? I can't do it. So I'm just going <laughs> to stick to that. But um, like I said, I, I would look at this not just as a, it, it's a minor stepping stone. Right. Yes. Yeah. How much of this is how much of that is true because of the futures element and how much of that is true because of the ether element? Like me and Ryan, we live like yeah. in Ethereum every single day, so it's a very big deal for yeah, us. Yeah, honestly, uh, the boomers should be a lot more bullish on ether they should than be. they probably are, but, yeah, but that's should, a different have you, conversation. You guys know Matt Hogan? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah, we've had him on the okay. podcast a handful oh, of times. He's he thinks ether should be should and will be bigger. Um, yeah, he's right. And I, I think just so you Matt know, might, not might financial advice. <laughs> Matt, I'm sure yeah. is a listener of Bankless. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, Matt is is a I trust Matt. He's a very smart mm -hmm. guy, one of the yeah. best communicators and presenters I've ever seen. Um, and that's a big statement from him. So, I I definitely feel you. I I think it's probably a little more of the futures element. Okay. Uh, like if Bitto launched today. They would not have a billion dollars in three days. Right. Uh, again, the mania in 2021 was off the chart. And remember, right. Bitcoin was mostly still unvarnished or right. unblemished. Yes. Yeah. FTX was a gigantic black eye. Right. So it, it is slow. It's going to be a real slow build up to get people won over. At that time, the FOMO was through the roof um, to buy at that price. Right. I know because that's when my wife was like, we should buy this stuff, $68,000 or whatever. Um, so, you know, when your friends and family and your college friends are like, how can I get this Bitcoin thing? That's when Bitto launched right there. Uh, right. Then it was a sell -off It was October 2021, like top yes, of the market. Th literally the peak. Literally yeah. the peak. So that's a, you got to just look at that as like a. Uh, zeitgeisty kind of moment. Right. You don't have that now. And so if Bitto launched now, it would be probably more popular than the Ether Futures ETF, but not that popular uh, as when it launched. Number two, mm -hmm. um, Ether ETFs amongst the all crypto funds in the world have 20% of the assets. That's pretty good. So over time, I would think in the US, an Ether spot would get one fifth of the assets of the Bitcoin ETFs. Again, based on the patterns of where we're at globally, because remember, these things exist in other countries. So I would think you're shooting for there. If Matt Hogan's right, maybe it grows beyond 20, but that's sort of where it's landed in the equilibrium currently with crypto funds globally. Mm -hmm. Okay, so really, I think the way that I interpret the significance of this whole thing is this is just an important stepping stone to get to the spot Bitcoin ETF and hopefully eventually the spot Ether ETF, which notably Grayscale did file to convert their trust into an ETF in the future, assuming that these things happen. And I think one of the indications here is with the approval of a spot Ether's ETF, the eventual spot uh, excuse me. Yeah, with the approval of a Ether Futures ETF, the Spot Ether ETF is inevitable in the fullness of time at some point, along with the Spot Bitcoin ETF. And this is happening in the bear market, in the crypto bear market. Meanwhile, SBF is currently going on trial, and so we're kind of like cleaning our past up a little bit. Uh, the significance for all of this, I think, will eventually culminate when crypto has some resurgence in price action, retained, regained some favor in the zeitgeist, and all of a sudden the price action of crypto assets now has bigger, much bigger pipes uh, to actually paint some big green candles when that when that inevitable like favor is regained by the crypto world in the future. That's kind of how I'm interpreting this. Yeah, I would say that. I mean, again, let's say like if you, if you have a, a store and somebody builds a bridge from your island with your stores on to like the mainland, Clearly, the store is probably going to get more business, maybe not on day one or day two, but over a couple of years, there should be more traffic, more foot traffic in your store, right? Just simply because there's a bridge and now you can drive instead of taking a boat. I would just, it's the same thing. You know, the inverse relationship I use to this is iTunes. 
um, I don't know if, if I'm probably dating myself at this point, or I could date myself even more with my band names. <laughs> um, remember on iTunes, like the Beatles held out for a while. Uh-huh. And they're, when they finally went on iTunes, all their albums went to number one, right? Because there was a lot of people there, namely younger people, who, would, who were like, oh, okay, I'll check the Beatles out now, simply because they're in the format I listen to. Right. Whereas they're not going to go buy a new Beatles CD or album. Mm. And it's almost the inverse where there's a lot of older investors, uh, advisors in particular, where once you put it in the format they love and know, uh, they're much more likely to take a nibble at it or use it as an asset allocation. Like, I don't think advisors would use gold at all if it weren't for GLD. <laughs> they're, just, they're not going to go buy gold bars and store them. Just be like, I yeah, to hell with it. We'll find something correlated. So this is similar to that. Um, there's a lot to be said for putting something where the people want it. Um, and the bridge is the best thing I can think of. But, um, you know, I would look for um, three, four years to get to this, you know, big boy asset place that gold is where you've got tens of billions. GBTC has 20 billion. So I think a lot of that's up for grabs. That's 20. And then you have maybe some new assets. And I do think over time, um, boomer advisors are undergoing a real uh, issue that concerns them, which is the generational transfer. So like they have a lot of clients who are 75, 80. And remember, boomers have like almost all the money in America. I think they have like 80% of all the wealth. Mm. But they're getting older and they're going to pass it on to their Gen X, millennial, Gen Z kids. And the advisor is worried that the, the kids are going to take their money somewhere else. So the advisor may actually want to get ahead of this by saying, hey, look, I'm cool. Uh, I'm going to give you a little crypto. You know, there may be that kind of a uh, motive for the advisor. Or when it does get passed on, the younger investor who's now using the same advisor is like, I want this. So I think that there's going to be some motive from the advisor just to uh, impress their younger, the kids of their inv- uh, clients. And the kids themselves could be like, I want this, sort of like, you know, I, you know, uh, grassroots style. But again, th- this is stuff that's going to take years and years to play out. But as I said, I think um, there'd be $100 billion less invested in gold if it wasn't for GLD. How I don't big think is, how big any is of that money. How big is gold, gold? Eric? ETFs. GLD, you mean of the how much gold is above ground or how much is in GLD? No, and, I think I know that like how much gold is above ground is like eight trillion or something like this. Is this uh you approximately right? Like the total market Sounds cap about of right, gold. because I think gold ETFs make up about one percent of the okay. gold above ground, which would put them ten trillion, eight trillion. But yeah. So a hundred billion is in gold ETFs. Okay. And so, What's the what's um so you know on Bankless yeah a, a lot of people listening are kind of like their own independent researchers financial advisors like they you know they kind of do it themselves um what can, can you give us a scope of how much money are we talking about in financial advisor world are we talking about in the in the trillions and is that the main liquidity source that we've tapped into it's all of kind of the you know, Chuck Schwab advisors and the independent financial advisors who have, you know, baby boomers with, you know, the retirement funds and that kind of thing. Is that what we've unlocked here? Or are we also unlocking like a big pool of institutional capital? Will like big pension funds be like, oh, you know what? We want some exposure to Bitcoin, Ether. We'll allocate X percent. We'll just buy the ETF. Is that another source? Get, you know, pay, paint us the size here, because I don't think we uh, often look outside of uh, our crypto bubble and, and see how much capital there is uh, in these other areas. Sure, uh, these are some rough numbers, but they're ballpark. Okay, so first of all, if you look at the who owns ETFs, advisors probably make up 75 percent of the ETF investors. Okay, like they're the main player that uses ETFs. Institutions probably 10% and do-it-yourself retail 15%, something like that. Hmm. So I would say that's what you're opening up. So advisors have 30 trillion in assets and they love ETFs. 30 that's why that's, trillion in assets that they manage they on behalf mm-hmm. of uh, primarily America, right? So this is U- US that's in America. advisors. I'm telling 30 you, trillion? Yeah, because once you get money in this life, I'm not sure where you guys are at, but once you get like a bunch of stuff, <laughs> You kind of less, you kinda less have than to last go, year. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, you know, 
these rich boomers have like they want to do estate planning they hate taxes how can i pay less taxes they have all this stuff going on right so that and they have all the money so the advisors are managing their money so that that's massive right that's why although the crypto trade publication one of them sort of mutated my words and said 30 trillion dollars coming for bitcoin and i was like no 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 <laughs> Maybe 0.5% of the 30 trillion is coming, which is about 150 <laughs> that's so billion. Lot. That's, so that's lot. still 150 billion, yeah. So that is a lot. Now, if there's one spot Bitcoin ETF that gets liquid, that will attract institutions. Institutions can get a lot of this on their own. They'll call up like BlackRock and just be like, hey, just make me a Bitcoin account or whatever. But the one thing that institutions cannot get anywhere else is liquidity. And so Institutions love really liquid ETFs like GLD, SPY, because they don't have to call anybody. They can get in and out without impacting the market. ETF trading is anonymous. Nobody knows they're there. And it, you don't have to call anybody. There's no contracts. It's just very easy, free. And in a crisis, they know the ETF will be liquid. They can get out. And so there will be institutions who will use the number one or number two, top two most liquid ones. And if you look at the holders of SPY and GLD, it's full of pensions, endowments, insurance companies, um, high-level hedge funds. Bridgewater is the biggest hedge fund in the world. It famously uses EEM, SPY, uh, even dabbles in stuff like um, some of the sectors. So that is the institutional element will be in the biggest traded one. Um, and then the retail investors, I think what they're going to come into is they may like to trade this, but what's... They like adrenaline. So when this 2X spot comes out, that's probably what they're going to hit up. Retail loves leveraged. They want to feel something. And Bitcoin probably <laughs> wanted to be volatile enough <laughs> for them. So they're going to wait till the 2X comes out and be like, okay, yeah, this is good. 10, 20% in a day. That's what I'm looking for. Yo, because so for <laughs> I can't believe I didn't know that there are 2X uh, crypto ETFs that are on the, on the potential yeah. menu here. Yeah, I mean, Bidex, by the way, Bidex has 50 million already. So, oh, wow. Um, that, that's a good sign. No, 30 million, sorry. But it charges 1.8%, which is a lot. But if you look at the uh, volatility on it, I mean, I'll just give you a, if you want the vol, it's, so it's 77% volatility so far. Uh, for, for context, the S&P 500 is less than probably that. 20, yeah. 12, 12. <laughs> So S and P five hundred is twelve percent. Nice Bitto is seventy seven. Okay. That essentially means that there's a two thirds chance that in one year the S and P will be up or down twelve percent. Bit uh, what Bitx is saying is there's a two thirds chance it'll be up seventy seven percent or down seventy seven percent. I can see that. And that 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 kind of volatility is very attractive to the retail crowd, uh, the the sort of Robin Hood types, which is why like the triple leverage Qs TQQQ and SQQQ are frequently in the top five most traded ETFs every day. They trade as much as like Microsoft stock. So I think a spot, a double leverage spot Bitcoin ETF probably will be the, will have this other appeal. So those are typically how those different player types invest. The advisor will go for the BlackRock and the cheap, right? Long-term, the institution will want the most liquid one regardless of fee. And the retail crowd will probably wait for the one that has the most jacked up ball. Really Love good it. insight. Wow. Love it. Looking back at my uh, previous self when I was buying uh, equities, I can definitely resonate with the people playing <laughs> with the two. I, I think I had like the 2X semiconductor ETF. And like, yeah, that one was a wild ride. <laughs> right. Like, like semis aren't enough. Like that's pretty uh -huh. much like semis alone are double, triple the ball of the S&P, but you need double. See, right. I call this the hot sauce bucket. Most mm -hmm. people yes. these days have a hot sauce bucket, even conservative people. They have like their retirement account, which is like, okay, just leave that over there. Right. Mm -hmm. It's good. It compounds, but it's boring as hell. Now, right. let me take 10, 15% and go absolutely wild. Yeah. And that's where I think this crypto <laughs> ETF would live for the retail crowd. Oh, my that. God. There's got to be so much product market fit with the retail crowd. Yeah, that's so fun. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, as crypto investors, Bitcoin and Ether are like our most boring assets. Yeah, and, they're real boring. And then boring. we have a hot sauce bucket <laughs> with some pretty <laughs> wild stuff. That is hilarious. It's all yeah. relative, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, all it's fractals. <laughs> yeah. Eric, this has all just been super informative. There are a few more things that we need to tie off this conversation about, just mainly the predictions, I would say. Uh, the predictions about Bitcoin ETF, 
the spot Bitcoin ETF and look, what about the spot Ether ETF? Can we start being like, can we start anticipating that? Uh, So we're going to ask these questions and more in the second half of the show. But first, a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible, especially MetaMask Portfolio. If you use MetaMask, I'm sure you do. You should probably open up MetaMask Portfolio. It's a cool new way to use MetaMask. There's a link in the show notes to get started. Let's go here for them. MetaMask Portfolio is your one-stop shop to manage your crypto assets and to tap into DeFi all in one place. And the most important part of that experience, buying crypto, obviously. MetaMask Portfolio's buy feature enables you to purchase crypto easily without going through centralized exchanges. Designed with you in mind, you can fund your wallet directly Directly in just a few clicks with convenience and simplicity. What happens when you press the buy button? Rather than being limited to a single payment provider, MetaMask brings together a bunch of vetted, trustworthy providers to present you with customized quotes for your crypto purchase. Once you've funded your wallet, you'll be able to plug into DeFi with all the money verbs like swapping, bridging, and staking. But first things first, you need skin in the game. Head over to metamask.io slash portfolio to buy crypto the easy way. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. And now, something big is happening. Introducing the Celo Layer 2. It's a game-changing proposal that's going to bring Celo's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared his excitement for the Celo Layer 2 on the Celo forum. So has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one block finality. What does all that mean? Rock-solid security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum. Follow at Celo org on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Safe, simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. Eric, I want to talk about um, some timing predictions. If we can get that out of you, what does this mean for the timing or probability of the incoming spot Bitcoin ETF? Which should we start holding our breath for a spot Ether ETF, or is that too far out? Uh, just what, what does this? What, what can we glean from the future of these uh, approvals? Okay, so. Uh, we are still, James and I are still holding the line at 75% odds of approval this year. Of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Of a spot Bitcoin ETF. This year, year 2024, this year. calendar year. No, 2023. Yeah, 2023, calendar year, sorry. 2023. Yeah. And look, we've held this line when it was not cool. When they first, when the SEC delayed about six of them, mm-hmm. um, we got dunked on even by crypto people. They're like, look at these, right. these guys were... Right. But <laughs> we, we like to do that in the crypto world. <laughs> I know. Um, by the way, the whole Ether, it's funny because when the Ether futures launched, there's a couple times that in my replies, there'd be a, a fight between a Bitcoin maxi and an Ether <laughs> yeah, person. Yeah, 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 I know. And sorry the one, for that the, too. Yeah, sorry. The, the maxi was like, <laughs> why should these even exist? The government's going to ban it. And I was like, really? <laughs> and then the, the other guy's like, no, no this the- guy is out of his mind. Yes. And so they yeah, just went, there, there they are some verifiable insane like people days. on crypto Twitter. Oh, yeah. It's fun, though. It's fun. The memes, the argument. There's a lot of uh, spirit, and I like that. Um, so I, it's okay. But, yeah, there's a lot of – there's a couple Ether haters oh, yeah. um, who, who when, they, when these came out and they didn't have the volume they thought, there was a lot of dunking yeah, on that, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. It's, it, it's the arena. It's what we call it. So the um, odds are still 75%. And I, I, not only did we hear the SEC is from multiple sources that the SEC is working with the issuers, which again is it breaks the pattern. It shows they're willing. Gensler also had two moments where we thought they showed signs of weakness, where he said we had our anchor from Bloomberg TV ask him about this, and he said, "Well, the spot ETFs look they're they're in registry. I can't comment, but look, I'm only one of five commissioners. 
little old me. So he's starting to hedge a little. <laughs> yeah, little old me. And then yeah. little old me, you know, if they approve him, hey, it's not on me. Um, and then the other one was he said something like, um, oh, w- when he was asking Congress about this, he said, well, look, uh, there are active filings. I look forward to seeing what the staff comes back with. Well, that's the same exact phrasing he used with Bitto. I look forward to seeing what the staff comes back with. So you can see he's almost trying to like d- diffuse that it's all on him, which I think is a good sign. Them reaching out is a good sign. And we've had two other things that I thought were interesting. Van Eck, Jan Van Eck, who was – when I've met with him, he's like, you guys, are, you guys are crazy. It's not happening. It could be years. He's now was on CNBC saying it's going to happen pretty soon. Wow. And Matt, Matt Hogan, who was firmly in the 2024 camp, was on CNBC uh, a couple days ago and said this calendar year. So I've seen two people shift forward. Kathy mm-hmm. Wood just said yesterday in a quote, odds are rising. And she was firmly in the 2024 camp. So yeah. it makes sense. All those people are issuers who got the email from the SEC. And the comments they're asking for are doable. They're fixable. They're not like anything crazy I've asked. So I think this is all very good. Um, That's why we're going to hold this year. That said, there's something in the back of my mind that thinks because of the holidays, it it could roll into like mid-January. I almost still think we deserve credit given how much we went on a limb and how much we hung there because we're we're, we're within a couple weeks. I'll still give us credit if it's by January 31st. But as we roll into the next year, our odds just go up and up. So that's sort of where we're at. Ether, in my opinion, I would expect that to be a month or two after Bitcoin based on logic and the feel for how the SEC operates. A month or two after Bitcoin? You think we could have an Ether spot ETF? Well, remember, they're already filed and there's been no withdrawals. The the difference, though, here is, Eric, is uh, Gensler himself has... Very much not, very much prevented himself, and he's been given ample opportunity to say that Ether is not a security, and he has not taken that um, opportunity he's deferred on that ever. Answer. He's deferred, and he, he's he's conceded that Bitcoin is not a security, but he won't get there with Ether, which feels at least to crypto people kind of watching this that he's got something in for like for Ether, uh, his reluctance to say that, and that might put a wrench in the in the works here well fine again remember this whole thing of like whether it's security is is i I can't say i'm in the weeds as much on that in terms of i i've heard that congress ask him the the pokemon card question and stuff and i i can see (laughs) that there's a lot of uh people who who are debating this but you have to understand that the the grayscale ruling said that you're your main your main premise on declining Bitcoin bot was that it was manipulation and fraud, and so they threw that out. Hmm. That was their main reason for Ether feud. Like that, it wasn't like their problem with it was security or not. It was that. So that that's gone. So if they approve spot, to me, it's sort of saying that okay, well, the, the court said we had to use a different reason, and there are none. Yeah, maybe it's possible that he says, look, we're about to go crazy on Ether and we just don't feel comfortable approving an Ether spot. I guess it's possible. Um, I probably want to talk to James a little more about it. He's a little more in the weeds on this. But based on the fact that you now have Ether futures, it would be a a bit silly to to not approve spot after you've approved Ether futures and Bitcoin spot to me. It would be like odd because there's a pattern to this and a cadence and that would just break from that. I just... um, I don't see it, but it's possible, I guess. Um, I think the what I'm just hearing is that you just think it's going to be a fast follow. Like w- once the flood, well, once the floodgates open of approvals, then approvals will be approved. Yeah, I because think uh, think about it now. Now, in this case, they've already been sued and lost. Let's say they decline the ETH. Someone could sue them and say, "Well, you accrue a spot on the same premise. What's your right. what right. ground are you standing on here?" So, right. there's an emboldenedness with the issuers lately. Right. Um, after. Yeah. Small shares running the stop sign and getting the BitX and the Ether out futures out, it's funny and the also sign. the grayscale loss. There's a lot of like the issues are getting more emboldened. I, I don't right. think any of them are afraid to sue. 
um, anymore. And so well, this is how I we feel on the crypto side of things. We feel like we are racking up wins, not just against Gary Gensler and the SEC, but generally in the court. And if we accept that that vibe is collectively happening across many different respects, that would be in line with that. We've also run a few stop signs, I think, here, uh, yes. here, here or there. So uh, that's to our benefit <laughs> without getting Listen, the ticket. It's, it's, it's better to have, ask for forgiveness than permission sometimes. <laughs> that's, that's crypto's motto, I, I think. I tell, my, I tell my team that all the time. I'm like, could we write research notes? I'm like, if you're not getting, like, if you're not getting called out or, or an email from the editors every six months, you're not doing it right. Yeah, You need absolutely. to take chances and, and push the envelope. And that's sort of what BallShares did. And um, I, I, in a way, I respect it because the SEC has made this so difficult on everybody. Um, but other issuers just didn't have the stomach to fight or to do that because they had all these other product lines. And so you don't want to mess with the SEC, but when you have very little going on, Volshares only had a couple of like really exotic VIX type stuff. They're like, eh, you know, what do I have to lose? So sometimes it takes a someone with nothing to lose to, to like, you know, shake things up. Be the one who, yeah, to, to sort of pioneer something. Absolutely. Uh, in this case, it was messing with the SEC and, and they won and Gracielle. Obviously, they in this case they had the money, um, and they won. And so, yeah, it's been a it's been a year where it, it shouldn't have come to this. No, I right. really I really silly. think all this could have been hammered out a couple of years ago, um, and none of this would have had Thanks, to happen. Gary. But you know, well, yeah, uh, we know. we certainly agree, <laughs> and this has been fantastic coverage. And and you and James uh, do do fantastic work on this. Eric, can, can you give a shout out for your Twitter handle, which is where people can go get the latest if if. If I listen to anyone about what's happening with crypto ETFs, I connect with you, Eric, and I connect with James. So what's your Twitter handle so people can follow? Sure. It's at Eric Balchunas. Um, so if you're watching, that's my name right there. Yes. That's it. Believe it or not, it was available in 2010. There were no other at Eric Balchunas. <laughs> <laughs> I just, are you sure? Well done. You got it. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> no, no, no. I've been, that's I've been on Twitter That's for a good walking. thing about having my name is that what? like, my email, by the way, my email is also at Eric Balchunas, both Bloomberg and Gmail. So I've never had to use a one, a two, or anything like real or anything. So oh wow, uh, well, very get... easy to find. What, what, one warning though, I sometimes tweet about like I'm an ETF analyst. So there's a JP Morgan equity ETF, and sometimes people are like, "Dude, I don't give a shit. I, I don't care about this. What's <laughs> going on with Bitcoin?" So I, I've noticed there's a crypto follower that isn't in love with the other ETF tweets, but yeah. you'll have to just wade through those to get to You the know why? You guys need to get, uh, you keep going down the, the stack here and I'm looking forward to that Pokemon uh, Pokemon card ETF that you guys mm -hmm. can roll out. And <laughs> if you don't, if you don't put it in an ETF, crypto will just tokenize it, okay? We'll front run you guys. <laughs> we'll we'll so do you it ourselves. put it in an ETF. I used to say that like, you know, ETFs are so good, you could put like baseball cards in there and people get a good deal. <laughs> and I get with po Pokemon cards. But yeah, um, I, I don't think we'll see that, but who knows? <laughs> who knows? Know. Who knows indeed? Well, yeah. Eric, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks you so much for, for having us on and talking about the Ethereum ETF Derby. It's been a great week for that. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Great talking to you and see you later. Risk of disclaimers, Bankless Nation, of course, none of this has been financial advice. Doesn't matter what generation you're in, millennial, Gen Z, a boomer, uh, Gen X, uh, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot.